So, you've already completed reading the text that we were reading together as a class, and you've already completely filled in and turned in your determining theme and tracking evidence worksheet, um, which at the bottom part, yours would be filled in, has a collection of quotes or paraphrases from that text, and your analysis of how each of those quotes supports the theme that you decided existed in the piece that we've read as a class, okay? So now that you've already done that and turned that in, which satisfied um, your grade for the 1.6 learning target, now we need to look at the 1.7 learning target, and that's where this beautiful colorful document comes in. You have your own copy of this in Google Classroom if you can't find it. If you click on the 1.7 topic on the left hand side, um, you'll get to it a lot faster. It's listed underneath the learning playlist and it's called Tika Notes, Practice, and Assessment. And you're probably thinking, what the heck does Tika mean? Well, I'm so glad you asked. So let's real briefly take a look at the proficiency scale again for 1.7. This target is all about using direct quotes and paraphrases from other writers in your own writing, okay? And doing that properly, of course. So, let's take a look at this wording here. In order to pass, you need to use appropriate quotes and or paraphrases to support text analysis. You need to appropriately introduce this evidence and properly punctuate and provide correct parenthetical citations for this evidence. That's a mouthful. None of that means much to you probably right now, but you're about to learn what all of that means and how you can do it properly. All right, so as it says here, when incorporating quotes in your writing, quotes from other people into your own writing, remember TIQA, T-I-Q-A. This is an acronym, of course, which means each letter stands for something. T stands for topic sentence. So if you're, this would be a paragraph, essentially. So you, as you probably already know, you start each uh, paragraph with a topic sentence. And this defines that for you. The topic sentence states the topic of this paragraph. Basically, what are you going to prove? What is the writer going to prove here? I stands for introduce quote. This is where you provide a transition from that topic sentence to the quote that you're going to drop and provide context for that quote. And what do I mean by providing context for the quote? Well, tell me who's speaking, tell me what's going on, etc., etc. Okay? Q is the quote. This is where you actually drop the quote. Now make sure that you're following the rules for quoting evidence and this document later on goes over what all of those rules are. And then A of course is analyze quote slash argue the topic. What does this mean? Well this is where you explain how this quote that you just gave me here proves the topic sentence statement. So whatever statement that you make, whatever argument you make in your topic sentence you need to tell me how this quote supports what you argued up there, where you spell it all out for me. All right, so that's what Tika means. Let's look at an example. So this is from a story called The Lottery, which you probably will read your sophomore year. Um, so the topic sentence is, the theme of Shirley Jackson's The Lottery is revealed through Old Man Warner's character. Okay. So remember, your topic sentence needs to tell me something about, in this case, um, about your theme, okay? Because you filled this whole thing out. You determined what you thought the theme of the text was, and you came up with some evidence to support that. So you need to tell me something about the theme. In this case, I'm telling you that that theme that I already mentioned is revealed through this specific character. So we know that my evidence is going to have to do with this character. That's a very good thing to do with your topic sense, to make it specific, as specific as possible. <clears throat> Here's where I introduce the quote. Notice this is just part of a sentence, because your I and your Q together form one complete sentence. So here's how I introduce the quote. For example, 
when he gripes about the young people, he says, now who's this he? I know it's old man Warner because I just mentioned that in the previous sentence. Okay, so see how in the red here, or in the I, the, I, the blue, I am providing a transition from that sentence into the quote, okay? For example, I'm talking about an example of Old Man Warner showcasing the theme, okay? For example, when he gripes about young people, he says, okay? So this is where I'm giving some meaningful context about what the heck's going on, is going on in my quote, okay? I already know who is speaking, Old Man Warner, and what's going on? Well, he's complaining about young people. And I tell you that in my quote introduction. That's valuable information. If I didn't have that there, this quote would be confusing and might not make sense. So here's my quote. Pack of crazy fools, there's always been a lottery. So let's read these together because as I said, and this is how it should be with yours, your I and your Q together form one complete sentence. For example, when he gripes about the young people, he says, pack of crazy fools, there's always been a lottery. There's my complete sentence. And now, for the most important part, this is where you analyze this quote and argue your topic. So whatever claim you made in your topic sentence, you're going to tell me how this quote proves that claim, and you'll do it in this orange part right here. So here's how I do it in this case. Here, Warner tried to make the case that simply because there always has been a lottery, that tradition should continue, and anyone who says otherwise is crazy. Because the lottery is obviously evil, and he is such an unlikable character, this supports the theme that tradition should not necessarily be honored. So this is where I am kind of explaining further what's going on in this quote, but more importantly, I'm explaining how that quote proves my topic sentence. So please make sure that you do that in your own analysis. All right, so when you get to this part in this document, I call it the paragraph dissection. As it says here, you're gonna copy and paste the parts of this Tika paragraph right here onto the table below so that you have correctly labeled the topic sentence, the quote introduction, the quote and the quote analysis slash argument. So basically, you're going to copy and paste these parts from up here, down here. Okay, so if you think this is the topic sentence, I'm kind of giving you the answer, which topic sentence is always the first sentence anyway. It'll get trickier when you're trying to determine where does the quote introduction end and the quote begin and what is the argument analysis. So anyway, you're going to copy and paste this paragraph down here so that you have it separated between the T, I, Q, and A of the Tika. And that's to help you see how that works. Okay? This part right here. These are all of the rules for quoting and paraphrasing evidence. Okay, really it should say quoting all across the board because we're not really working with paraphrases, we're mostly working with quotes. So there are four rules here, one, two on this page, and three, four on this page. And each rule or guideline gives you a bad example of how not to do it and a correct example of how to do it. I'm going to tell you right now, hear me when I say this, in order to get to a four on your proficiency scale, you have to be able to explain these rules, okay, in your own words. You need to remember and be able to explain out of your own head these rules, okay? So um, take the time when you get to this part of this document to, if you need to make flashcards to help you study, write them out on paper and study them, whatever helps you you need to be able to explain the rules for quoting evidence, okay? And it says that right here. This is how you get to a four. All right, so the first rule, always introduce evidence, whether it's quoted or paraphrased. You always have to give an introduction, okay? You can never, it should say here, never start a sentence with a quote. In fact, I'm gonna add this in here right now. Never 
begin a sentence with a quote. Okay, because let's look at what it happens when you do that. This is the wrong way. Romantic poetry is marked by its highly emotional content, period. Spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings, period. Makes no sense, okay? This quote is just dropped here without an introduction. It sounds weird. It does not make sense, right? So here's the right way. When it does have an introduction, this is how it sounds. Romantic poetry is marked by its highly emotional content. Wordsworth stated that romantic poetry was marked by a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. Okay, see how the quote introduction flows directly into the quote and together they form a coherent sentence. That is your goal. Okay, next, number two. Always put quotes inside quotation marks. And by inside, I mean you need to have the full set of quotation marks, the beginning and the end quote. Okay? This one should be fairly easy for you to remember. If it's a quote, it goes inside quotation marks. So here's a common mistake. Now, one mistake is to drop the quotation marks altogether. I don't see that as often as I see this mistake right here. I see somebody starting the quote marks and then forgetting to finish them. See how the second half is missing? Okay, whereas over here, we've got the quote marks on either side. So make sure you're being very careful about that. Those details really matter when you're quoting things. Okay, let's look at the third rule. It says, always put page number after the quote or citation. This is, the, this is what's called the internal citation, and it goes after the end quotation mark, but before the end punctuation for the sentence. Put the page number inside parentheses, okay? Now here is a common mistake that I see. This is not how to do it. Do not put PG period or P or PP 263, anything like that. The page number is just the number itself, and it goes inside parentheses, and as it says here, it goes after the end quotation mark. So see how the quote is from here to here. We close our quotation mark, space, and then inside parentheses, but before, before the end punctuation, we have in parentheses our page number, just the number, 263, and then the period at the very end. So please notice the, num the order that these, um, all of these punctuations go in. We have the end quote, parentheses, page number, end parentheses, and then the final period. This is how this looks. Now you might be wondering about why there isn't a period right here, and that is the final rule to consider. So let's look over here. If the end punctuation for the last quoted sentence is a period, then you can leave it out. In fact, you do need to leave it out. But if it's a question mark or exclamation point, leave it in. So this is the wrong way to do this, and I see students doing this a lot. They want to put their period for the whatever they're quoting right there and then close the quotation and then put the page number and then put a second period. Um, whoever decides these things, which isn't me, decided that we do not put this period right here. It does not go there. We just leave it off. Instead, we just put the period after the citation like that. And so it should look just like it looks right here. There's no period after feelings. There's a quote mark. There's the page number inside parentheses and then the period. Now, what if Wordsworth had said spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings with an exclamation point or powerful feelings with a question mark? Those two types would go there and then you would still have a period at the end. 
But if it's just a period that Wordsworth wrote, which it was, then we leave it off. Okay. So again, there's only four rules here. They seem a little bit complicated, but you're free to watch these explanations again if you need them or study the incorrect and correct examples that I provided. But either way, in order to get to a B or an 80% or a 4 out of 5 on this proficiency scale for this learning target, you need to be able to explain in your own words these four rules. So whatever's going to work for you to study those four, do so. Okay, when you get to this part of this document, you're ready for the assessment. And the assessment is where you are going to write your own TICA paragraphs. Okay, so let's look at the directions. First things first, open up your 1.6 determining theme and tracking evidence worksheet in Google Classroom. That's the first sentence of the directions. Now, there's my annoying neighbor on his motorcycle. I wonder if you can hear that in this crappy microphone. He's annoying me. Okay, so this is the thing document that I'm talking about. You already turned this in, and hopefully you've already gotten a grade back for the 1.6 learning target, because your grade for that learning target was based on whatever you did right down here. Okay. Um, if I have not graded it and turned it back over to you, you can still open it and look at it, okay? Um, but you don't need to unsubmit it yet. If, if I have not graded it and turned it back to you, please do not unsubmit it because that means that I'm still taking a look at it to get you a grade for the 1.6 target. But I would be surprised if I haven't turned that back to you by now. Um, so open it without um, unsubmitting it because you don't, shouldn't need to make any edits to it anyway. So leave that there, open that up, and as it says here, scroll to the bottom where you collected quotes and analyzed how those quotes supported what you determined the theme of the text to be. All that sentence means is scroll down to here, okay, where you have quotes and you have your analysis. Now, I want you to read back through those and pick your three best quote argument pairs. So you can pick this one, this one, this one, for example. If you have five to choose from, I want you to pick what you think your three strongest are. For each of these three, write a complete TICA paragraph in the table. So, essentially, you should have, from this column is your Q, of your tika, your quotes, and this column should be the A of your tika, your analysis slash arguments, your Q and your A. So this shouldn't be too, too complicated. Um, the main thing that you're working on here is writing a topic sentence and then introducing this quote, which means, so remember your topic sentence is some sort of statement about the theme and how you're about to present that theme in your quote. Your I makes a direct connection between that topic sentence and gives context for the quote that you're about to drop. But your quote and your argument and analysis, you could pretty much copy and paste from this table. Now, if you, um, your analysis, if you chose to just shoot for a three on this learning playlist, maybe you didn't even do this side. So now you have to do it in order to fill out your TICA paragraphs. Um, or perhaps you did it, but you're unhappy with it, you wanna change it, that's fine. You can make changes and fine tune your analysis here, but um, at least for a start, you can copy and paste your quotes in your analysis. Filling in your topic sentences and your quote introductions three times so for three different quotes and you can see that there are three different tables for you to do that after you finish these three in order to get to a four remember you need to explain the rules for quote introductions punctuation citations etc that's on a separate sheet of paper that I can give you upon request so after you finish and turn in this document Ask me how you can shoot for a four, okay? 
And then um, beyond that, remember there's a separate task to get to a 5.